Welcome to the Stories Told Podcast. This is episode 36. We love Ouroboros. This is the Stories Told Podcast. Two authors talking about stories in movies, TV, and of course, books. I'm Michael Grayford. I write action adventure stories in fantasy and sci fi worlds sometimes for younger readers and sometimes for adults. And I try to always inject at least a little bit of humor. And I am author E.W. Barnes, and I write action adventure, time travel novels, and space opera science fiction. Thousands of years, thousands of worlds. But be forewarned, beyond here, there will be spoilers. Are you ready for the adventure? Let's begin. Welcome back to the Stories Told Podcast. I'm author E.W. Barnes, and with me is author Michael Grayford. And today we're talking about the story told in Episode 1, Season 2 of Loki. How are you doing today, Mike? I'm good. It's a little chilly here, but it's a nice change from the summer heat. Um, Nice. I'm doing good. (laughs) How are you doing? We're doing well here. We actually have snow at the highest elevations already. And what's new in your writing world? Oh, new in the writing world. Uh, let's see. Mostly I've just been trying to deal with organization, just coming up with a list of tasks that have sort of been building up that I need to handle, primarily getting into like marketing and advertising and promotion for my book, which is out, but I haven't really promoted at all yet. (laughs) So I need to come up with a plan for that. Um, I'll probably pretend like I have an official launch date, you know, sometime in the future, even though it's already out, (laughs) just because I haven't done any kind of push at all because of my move. Uh, So I've just been focusing on uh, coming up with a plan for that primarily and catching up on other things, you know, resulting from the move and settling into the new place. And what about you? What's going on in your writing world? You know, just still working on Ecliptic, which is the second book in my science fiction space opera series, The Adventures of the Empyrean Guard. Uh, I have a really good question for you, though, because one of the things that I do, as we've talked about before, is I will have a 30,000 foot idea of where I'm beginning and where I want to end. But frequently in the middle, I just let my creativity go and I come up with stuff. And coming up with stuff means that I frequently come up with new characters and new rules, technological rules, cultural rules, or whatever. And sometimes that's really hard to keep track of. Do you or have you created a world Bible for your stories? Yes, I do that uh, now, partly as, as part of the process of coming up with the outline you know ahead of time in my what i call my pre-production process i do that as part of that i create a bible and i throw ideas into there and then of course like you said as i write you know i come up with other ideas some things change some things get added some things get removed i update that as i go i wouldn't say it's like a super thorough you know lord of the rings level (laughs) world bible i put in there stuff that I'll need to remember um, that may come up later or things that I need to maintain consistency. And that's in addition to, you know, whatever character sheets, character documentation I write up. So, yes, I do. Probably not as thorough as it should be for some of them. But, yeah, I I, I do. I create it. Uh, It's it's not like some formal, well-structured thing. It's more of Here's some ideas for the world. Here's these different settings and what happens there, things like that. I have a uh, binder that I keep because I like paper and I write, et cetera. I'm kind of a tactile learner. I have a binder with the World Bible and, like you, the character notations, plot notations, et cetera. But I don't really have a process for updating it. And I think I need to think about how to do that so that it's updated on a regular basis so I can go back and refer and not miss important rules that I create in my worlds because 
that's doesn't make for a quality reading experience if you create one more rule and then forget the rule later. Right. Yeah. The, when I first started writing the first book that I wrote, I had a lot of I was doing mostly world building stuff, just ideas for how the world was set up and how things came to be and how the magic worked and all this kind of thing. And like you, it was all paper. It was in a, in a notepad um, and I was just writing it down. But then I ran into the problem that you're talking about. <laughs> where it's like, oh, wait, I want to change things or add things or update things. And that's when I switched over to everything being on the computer because it was just too much of a pain to try to do it on paper at that point. Whereas on the computer, is, you know, it's easy to update things. I can move things around. I can organize things. Yeah, so I would recommend that. But I, I do understand that the tactility of writing is a different experience than, you know, typing it in and copying, pasting yeah. on the computer. Well, and I do have a computer generated matrix at, that I update on a regular basis, but I frequently okay. handwrite notes onto that. And then, so what I don't have is the process for taking my handwritten notes on, on the computer generated matrix that's in the binder and, up, you know, updating it on the computer. I just, I have to figure out a way to do that on a regular basis so that it's, yeah. I have a clean version like once a month or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And then if I have a clean version, then it's something that, you know, if, if people are interested, it, it's something I could offer, you know, the world Bible is uh, something I could offer on Patreon to folks who, you know, might be interested in seeing more detail about these particular, the characters and the places and the people, etc. Yeah. That's a great idea. I haven't offered it yet because it has spoilers. Yeah, I'm the same way I have. For the, for the first story that I wrote, I have, like I said, I had the I was creating world stuff. And I have uh, plans for probably at least nine books in that series spread through different time periods. And maybe maybe more books than that if I want to go farther out. But yeah, it's the same thing. It's like I've got like a timeline of things that happen you know, in this series, in this series, in this series, and how it affects the world and how it affects the characters throughout time. So yeah, that would be a huge <laughs> spoiler there. I will probably produce and make available after the series comes out so that if people want to dig in more, they can, but they don't have to, you know, have, the, have things spoiled beforehand. So yeah. What interesting stories have you come across in books or movies or TV lately? Let's see. I Well, I finished Ahsoka. I think I mentioned that last time. And then I have started watching the latest season of Only Murders in the Building. Have you seen that? No. It's a, it's a, it's a Hulu show. It's with Steve Martin, Martin Short, and Selena Gomez. And they live in this old, you know, apartment, condo, building, whatever, in... Uh, New York, I believe, and they so they're all interested in this podcast that that this like murder mystery podcast. So they start they get together and they start talking about that, and then someone dies in their building. So they of course start investigating it and start their own podcast about their investigations, <laughs> and and they call their podcast "Only Murders in the Building" because they're just gonna, just going to talk about murders that happen in their building. Like there's going to be more than one. <laughs> So it's pretty funny. It's like a funny murder mystery kind of show. That's awesome. I I love Steve Martin. Yeah, they they work really well together, the three of them. What about you? What have you come across? We finished Ahsoka too, as well. I mean, we finished Ahsoka as well, and we've been, of course, you know, watching Loki in preparation for our conversations about it. And my offspring is um, wanting me to watch Stranger Things, which I haven't seen yet. But I've been leaning towards wanting to watch Wednesday again to get me in the Halloween mood. So I think there's probably a way to do both in the time that we have remaining before the holiday. Oh, yeah. So that's our kind of Halloween plan. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I haven't seen the last season or the latest season, I should say, of Stranger Things. But I... I remember very little from the previous season, so I'd almost have to go back and watch it from the beginning again to catch up on things. My offspring is recommending season one only. Oh, just oh, just season one, not to catch up. Okay, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm okay with that. And that I think that gives enough time to be able to watch Wednesday and Stranger Things before Halloween. Yeah, there you go. Are you ready to talk about Loki? Sure, let's do it. All right, let's begin. Today we're talking about the story told in Episode 1, Season 2 of Loki. And I am going to read the synopsis that comes up on Google when you type in Loki, Season 2, Episode 1. Loki finds himself lost to time and torn, quite literally, between past, present, and future. So what did you think about this episode, Mike? I like the episode. It felt it felt fun. I was engaged. I liked that they picked up right from where they left off at the end of season one. Yeah. Which which is good because they kind of left us hanging there. But I think they did a good transition. Of like, okay, here's where we were. Here's where we're going now. It felt uh, a little a little different, maybe, because there's a lot going on. You know, with him jumping back and forth in time. I I love how they joked about what, what he looks like when he gets pulled through time. Because <laughs> it was just like this really awful visual, like this horrible thing. And then they actually made fun of that. I thought that was pretty good. It's a lot of, a lot of good humor throughout. I would say I think they did pretty well. Like Mobius losing all of his skin. <laughs> Funny stuff. And I liked, I loved Ouroboros. Obi with uh, Kei Hui Kwan. Uh, he reminded me of his kid characters, like from the Goonies and Indiana Jones back in the day. So he had that same vibrancy to his characters. I thought he was played well. And I like how they set up the 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 challenge that Loki faced. Because when he came back at the end of last season, he's just there. and He's in the TVA. And we didn't know anything about him being, you know, coming unstuck in time. Right where he's bouncing around. So this is a new thing they introduced, and they get us into that pretty quick. So as a viewer, again, like with the first season, it starts off. There's a lot going on, and you're kind of always, you know, sort of off balance, not sure what's coming next. So this episode definitely continues that. Where you're like, I don't know where this is going. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure where we're headed. Which could be bad if they don't have a good setup for it, but I think they probably have a plan. Obviously, the episodes are already out, are already written, um, so we'll we'll see where it goes. But uh, yeah, I was I was definitely caught a little off guard. It's it's a, a bit chaotic as to what's happening, but it's fun. I'm interested, and I'm looking forward to see where this goes. What about you? Chaotic is a word I wrote in my notes too. I loved the pace. I loved how, it, like you said, we just jump right in exactly, almost exactly at the same moment we left at the end of season one. And I really like that. Now, I don't know if they, they filmed it right away or they waited, but I think sometimes when there's a delay between episodes, sometimes they kind of, they kind of forget either exactly where they were or what they were doing or the intensity of what they were doing. And they didn't do that here. It was... Boom, right, moving right along. And I, I really liked that. And there was no downtime in this episode at all. You also were going along with this mystery of what was going on. You know, what's happening to Loki? Why is it happening? Where is he going? What is he seeing? And, and we eventually figure out that he is traveling back and forth through the past, present, and future, as the synopsis said, at different times in the TVA, which is fascinating because it's all the same people. Right. It's just the sort of circumstances that have changed. And what's really fascinating is the implication that in the past, Kang was the face that was hanging over the TVA instead of the timekeepers. But our people don't remember that. There is a lot of layers here that still need to be unpacked. And I love that. It's like sitting down in front of a five course meal and you just know every step is going to be really good. I'm really looking forward to learning more about what's going on here. Yeah, I agree. I especially, I agree with you, the banter. We got right back to the great relationship between Mobius and Loki. That is, that is a foundational element to this story. I think 
The relationship between Loki and Sylvie is really foundational and very compelling. But the relationship between Mobius and Loki is much more like bedrock to this story. Ooh, that's a good point. Yeah. I really like that they got back into that relationship right away. They trying to figure out what's going on. They're more trusting of each other than ever before. Because Mo Mobius like now trusts Loki. Whereas in season one, Mobius was like always one step ahead of Loki's machinations. Now they're both just sitting there going, I have no idea what's going on, but we're going to figure it out together. And you just know that eventually down the road here, this friendship's going to be tested and tested hard. And I'm looking forward to seeing how they do it. I think the writing is setting this up really beautifully. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I love Ouroboros. I think this is a great character. And one of the things that I made a note of here is how all the characters that we're seeing here, and it was last season, we got to spend more time with a lot of the characters last season. We got to spend more time with Mobius and Renslayer. And this episode, we got to see a whole bunch of characters all at once. And they were still given layers and three-dimensionality. And that's such great writing. I mean, we had like the little meeting of the administrative heads of the TVA, and each one of them has a perspective. And you can see how different they are. You can see how unique they are. And I'm not talking visually. I mean, personality-wise, they're unique. And I, I don't remember the names of the characters, but we've got the one character who is out to get Sylvie with one of the hunters, and there's some kind of intimacy between them. I thought that was fascinating. It took two seconds to show this relationship between the two of them, but it adds another layer to the mystery. It was brilliant. That's the same thing we got to see with Ouroboros. This is a Mr. Fix-It at the TVA, and yet... Within moments, we had so much layers of character. You know, he remembers things, and that's really fascinating. He remembers things that Mobius doesn't. Why? I love the character. I love how... I hope we see him again. I hope he isn't just a one-off, one-episode ep kind of character who was there to provide exposition, which, by the way, I made note of how great that exposition was. It was so natural. He was there to explain some things, but it didn't sound like he was explaining things. And it was really organic and natural and a part of his character. His sort of providing us information was part and parcel of the kind of character he was. I'm just thinking this is great, brilliant writing. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are great notes. Yeah, the Ouroboros character is very interesting. It's like he knows all this stuff, but it seemed, he seems almost outside of the rest of the TVA. Yeah, because the other people seem sort of sort of clueless as to what's going on, right? And like, like you said, you know, somebody sometimes they don't remember things, and he remembers all of this, and he he's read all the rules because he wrote them, or or, or he wrote the manual or something like that. So, yeah, I I as well. I hope they don't. I hope this isn't just a one-off character. I hope they they use him, if not throughout the season, at least we, he pops up again. Yeah, I think he has the opportunity to provide, continue to provide humor because there's a lot of humor with what, how his interactions go. And also a good way of giving us exposition and kind of smoothing out some of the rough spots maybe in how the system of the TVA works. What I'm wondering, based on what you just said, as I was listening, I was thinking in the first season we had Miss Minutes who kind of provided some exposition for us. And then we learned at the yeah. end of the first season that she was. The relationship is unclear, but appears to be a tool of Kang the Conqueror or He Who Remains or whatever he calls himself. And in the same way, I'm kind of wondering now if Ouroboros, being so knowledgeable about the TVA the way Miss Minutes was, if he is not also some kind of tool of He Who Remains or Kang or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I didn't even think about that, but that could be. I do wonder how his character works because. He knows all this stuff and it's, he's like, oh, this thing's over here and that's over there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And at the same time, he said he's kept constantly busy by, you know, the pneumatic tubes that keep coming down. So like, how, how is he managing all of these things? And it, it raises questions of how does the time work yeah. in the TVA, right? That's one of the questions that I, I was wondering from the beginning with Loki's getting pulled back and forth 
And they said like time works differently there. It's like, how does it work? Because there's obviously a past, present and future in the TVA, but also everything's changed in the TVA now. So that adds another yeah. dimension to it. I, I like how, like at the end of the previous episode or previous season, right? When Loki comes back, he gets pushed through the door and he shows up and it's all, everything's different. So, you know, okay, the, the world has kind of changed and Mobius doesn't, recognize him anymore so like oh everything changed from out you know now he's in like a different version of the tva which is true but in in this episode we also learn that the reason that mobius doesn't remember him is because he's in the past <laughs> like that wasn't even hinted at in last season so that was a cool new wrinkle that they added yeah it's a lot of playing with time which is a risky business as, <laughs> yes. as you know it's like the, time travel has all kinds of has all kinds of you know potential problems and pitfalls yeah. with trying to explain things. So the more you play with it, the, the more potential holes you open up in your plot. So it's going to be interesting to see how they play this out. It's funny that you should mention that because as we talked earlier about World Bibles, when I wrote my time travel series, I did have a visual timeline with sub-timelines related so that I could keep track of it all because you had to. Yeah, you have to. And in this one, they do the the thing where you sort of like the the character's timeline progresses yes. in real time, even if they go in the past. So when Loki goes in the past and he's talking to Ouroboros, Ouroboros' memories in the future yes. are being updated as Loki's experiencing them as if he were in the present still. <laughs> it's It's... Yeah. I loved that. I absolutely loved that. So is there anything that you might have done differently? It's hard to say because not knowing where they're going, it's hard yeah. to it's hard to think, oh, they should have done this and should have done that. Because it's there's a lot of weird stuff going on, right? And it's a lot of chaos. So right now there's a bit of confusion, but also it's kind of mystery. I'm like, okay, how are they gonna handle this how is this going to work out when loki gets pruned apparently you know toward the end of the episode but then he's back like what happened there we don't really know about but i mean those were intentional decisions right it's not like oh but they just accidentally did this <laughs> right there's a reason the writers wrote that in there i guess the one thing i would i'm left wanting is just more explanations for like how stuff works. How does the time work there? How does like, are they outside of these other timelines? Are they themselves at the end of time? Or, like what is the dimension that they're in? There's like a lot of like weird sort of technical questions of how things work, which ordinarily wouldn't necessarily be you know, significant or relevant to the story. But in this case, I almost feel like they are because it's, so intertwined. Um, so I'm hoping that they explain some of that as we go forward. And then also with Ouroboros, this is such a knowledgeable person about what's going on, uh, who's been apparently locked away down there and only comes out every couple hundred years or whatever it is to fix something. How does he know so much? That's sort of an unknown thing. That's that's another reason I want this character to come back so we get more about him and his background. and. So it doesn't feel like, oh, he was just a tool needed for the plot. I really hope that isn't the case, but we'll see. Um, as far as what I would improve, I, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll see if these questions get answered as we go on. What about you with the things that stood out like, oh, they should have done this or I would have done that? Very little, like you said, because it, it is, it, this is a story that is unfolding one episode at a time. So I, I agree with you 100%. It, it, a lot of the questions may be answered. From a writing standpoint, what I made note of was a couple of things. One, and maybe it isn't a writing thing, maybe it's just a watching thing, but we use the word chaotic several times talking about this episode. It was almost hard to follow because there was something so much going on so quickly. I was actually grateful for when Ouroboros showed up because things slowed down then, and then I could catch up and kind of figure out what was going on. Yes. I liked the pace of how fast it was going, but sometimes it almost went too fast for me. That may just be a me thing. I think I felt that too, which I generally like. I like when 
shows don't linger. They kind of sort of get to the point and move along. I mean, if you know, I would contrast this with Ahsoka, which I just watched and you just watched, which is very much yeah. not <laughs> that way. <laughs> There's a lot of over dramatic pauses in that show. I think the other thing I would have changed from a writing standpoint is that when we are in the quote unquote present with the Mobius that knows Loki, we also interact to some degree with other members of the TVA. And we're not seeing the panic that I would expect to see with all of the timelines branching because their job is to keep this sacred timeline going, right? And even though the rest of the staff don't know what's going on, they do see, because they've got all these monitors everywhere, that the sacred timeline has got bonkers. And yet they're all so calm. I would have liked to have seen some freaking out from the staff to kind of add to that sense of everything is falling apart. We see it with the admin. The admin's all meeting and they're stressed and they got to try to figure out what to do about the sacred timeline. And Hunter 15, is that what Hunter... 15? Is that her name? Anyway, she, she's saying, you know, we're all variants and this isn't true and the timekeepers aren't real. And she's she's got her own perspective of what's there to panic about. But the staff should be panicking about the sacred timeline going bonkers. Right. That's a good point. And when they were in this sort of council meeting, the thing I was thinking about in there, they're, you know, they're deliberating about what to do and, you know, we need to keep going with this or we need to change that or whatever i'm thinking from from my perspective right if if i already know about what's going on if i'm mobius if i'm you know i forget what the other woman's name was or her designation was i'm thinking this whole meeting is pointless (laughs) like everything's changed it's just kind of wasting time here yeah like let's let's get on with things it's like i don't need to be in this meeting what are you going to do Right? What authority do you even have at this point? So, so have some of the, the, the chaos be part of the interactions among all these people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So as a writer, what's your takeaway from this episode of Loki? I generally tend to focus more on plot just naturally, as like, like how my brain works. But since I don't necessarily know what's going on yet even though I found a lot of this stuff interesting. For me, like, like you brought up, the more interesting aspect is the characters. I really like the Mobius character and how he's come. He's sort of warm to Loki. And like you said, he trusts him now. And they're going to figure this out together. And how they've, they've kind of bonded. It's like, okay, we've got to make this work. You know, it's like we're both going to risk our lives for each other, essentially. Well, I guess Mobius is just risking his life for Loki, actually. But it's neat to see that change in those characters in particular. I thought the introduction of the Ouroboros character. Um, So for me, I think it's it's about whatever's happening in the plot, even if you have a chaotic plot, remembering that your character development needs to be continuing. And that's the thing that that the viewer or the reader really latches onto more than anything. Excellent. Yeah. For me, it's uh, keeping an eye on that pacing. There's good, strong pacing that keeps people engaged, but then not pushing it so hard that you lose people because it's too much. And then, like you said, making those characters really pop, and especially those supporting characters who are layered and three-dimensional, even in just a, a moment. Yes. Yeah, that's great. And we thank you for joining us as we talked about the story told in Episode 1, Season 2 of Loki. A big thank you to our Patreon supporters and all our subscribers. We're so grateful for your support and encouragement. The Stories Told podcast is available on multiple podcast platforms, and we thank you for liking and subscribing or following, depending on where you're listening. It may not be a big deal to you, but it means a lot to us. You can find Michael Grayford at michaelgrayford.com and E.W. Barnes at a thousandyears.com, and those links are in the show notes. Join us next time as we discuss the story told in Don't Date the Haunted and interview its author, C. Ray Dark. Thank you, Mike. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. And we'll see you next time on the Stories Told podcast. 